Uh, you can see that actually I, I was grading everybody's. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're all missing the first one. And it was because I had mismarked it on my uh, answer key. So a base is a proton acceptor, and as you guys know, that's D. So D is the right answer there. For question two, you can kind of see where I put the conjugate acid base. So to show the conjugate acid of this thing, you have to show it with a one extra proton. Um, so B is the best answer there. For the next one, uh, which is the strongest acid, that would be the largest Ka, so that's D. For the next one, um, if you increase the, the ratio of base to acid by a factor of 10, or to be decreased by a factor of 10, that means that this ratio in the henderson hasselbalch equation is one-tenth of what it used to be. So if you take a log of one-tenth, you get a minus one. So that's why then the pH of the buffered solution will go down by one. Uh, the next one, uh, benzoic acid is pKa of 4.20. What would the, um, the K be for its conjugate base be? And so the answer here is you had to convert the pKa into Ka and then recognize that, that's how I did anyway, that um, the Kb is equal to Kw over Ka. And then you get the answer to C there. So it's 6 times 10 to the minus 10th. For the next one, um, acids that ionize um, uh, extensively are called strong acids. For the next one, we have a conjugate, wait, we have a, an aqueous solution of benzoic acid, what would, which is a weak acid. What would happen if I add strong base to it? And then I kind of wrote down here what would happen. For your strong base, it's going to actually then abscond onto the proton of your um, benzoic acid, and it's going to create this conjugate base. So uh, the pH would become more basic. That's what the pH increases means. The second one was also true that the concentration of your uh, benzoic acid would decrease. So the three is not true because actually it's contradictory to, uh, to one, which is your, it would become more basic. Uh, number eight, which is the following um, are strong acids. <laughs> I don't know if you can see, see my subtle C. I can't remember what the strong acids because I don't use um, for chloric acid very much. So um, phosphoric acid, I thought was a strong acid, but it's a weak acid. Pretty strong, but weak. So E is the answer there. A, B, C, and D are all strong acids. The next one, we're changing up the temperature, and as you change up the temperature and this increase, increasing, excuse me, decreasing the temperature, your Kw is going to be smaller. Okay, so. At this colder temperature, then, what would be your um, the hydroxide, hydrogen and hydroxide ion concentration? And that would just be the square root of that new Kw. So 5.4 times 10 minus 8. For the next one, talking about um, equivalence point, uh, titrating, let's see, which of the following is met by equivalence point? Titration of a monoprotic weak acid with a strong base. I and mean, that's kind of what we talked about a minute ago, but in this case, if you're at the equivalence point, and actually this came up later in one of the problems, you're at the equivalence point, these two things are gone, and what you have then is you have formed the conjugate base of that weak acid. So B is actually the only correct statement. The moles, the moles of base added from the uric equal to the initial moles of acid. Everything else is not true. By definition, at the equivalence point, the moles that you added, since it's a monoprotic um, acid, would be equal to the moles that were in there. Uh, amphiprotic are substances that can either behave as a base or an acid. So, okay. All the following are true about buffers except. So A through D are true, and it's not true E that buffers are used as colored indicators. Um, for the next one, which of the following has the strongest conjugate base? And these are weak acids, so you would be, remember there's an inverse relationship. So um, the weaker the acid, the stronger its conjugate base. So in this case, we're looking for the smallest Ka, which the, it's E, is the smallest Ka. 14, which of the following is true of the titration of a weak acid with a strong base? Again, a weak acid with a strong base. And um, actually, uh, at or, let's see. 
Uh, it's true that at the equivalence point, um, my WA is gone, my SB is gone at the equivalence point, and all I have is the, now the conjugate basis of that weak acid. So A is true, that's going to be basic, otherwise called a pH greater than 7. 15, all of these would make good buffered solutions except for E. And you can kind of see that I have outside, um, and my, 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 thing, my lines kind of get lined up, but this D goes with this. You know, C here. All these are conjugate acid base pairs. You can't get one out of NaOH and HCl. 16, um, before I even, and I know some of you guys do this too, before I even looked at my choices, I actually took this um, equilibria and identified the conjugate acid base pairs. So they differ by a proton. So we have H2S and HS minus are conjugate acid base pair, and H2O and H3O plus. The conjugate acid base pair. And then if you look at that, then D is the only one that fits the bill there. Um, so, which of these uh, salts, if they were in a 0.1 molar uh, concentration, would have the highest or be the most basic? And as it turns out, um, D is the correct answer because. NO2, now not to get confused with NO3, because that's nitrate, but NO2 nitrite actually can form an acid. Um, HNO2 is nitrous acid? Oh. Some sort of acid. Um, nitrous acid? But anyway, so the fact that it can be uh, form a weak acid means that actually in its polyatomic ion form, NO2 minus, it can accept the proton. So that makes it basic. Um, 18, which would be the best to buffer to pH 7? Remember to look for your best buffer. You look for your Ka to be near your pH, I mean pKa to be near pH. So you can see I went ahead and calculated all the pKa's uh, given those Ka's, and 7.21 is the closest to 7. You can also just kind of look at the power that 10 is raised to. It gives you a ballpark. Uh, 19, which of the following correspond to the um, acid ionization for uh, hi uh, hydrogen carbonate, HCO3 minus? So if I'm talking about it being an acid, I'm talking about being a proton donor. So up there in blue, you can kind of see that I went ahead and wrote what that looks like. Now, E looks a little different than that because we go ahead and throw in an H2O molecule on the reactant side and then show my H plus um, combining with my H2O to form the hydronium ion. So, E when I wrote is the same thing. Uh, for the last one, if you have equal molar, equal molar quantities of this weak acid and that weak base, um, which, uh, what do you think? Which of these are true? And I just kind of eyeballed it. And notice that your weak base has a smaller KB than your weak acid has a stronger KA. So that's what I said. All right. So for the Nick, the problems. Um, these I don't think I. I just kind of leave you to kind of look at them and double check how that worked. I don't think there's anything too tricky there. Uh, for question four. From that titration curve, you were supposed to give me some information. So you can see on the graph, I put a little dot there. That's my EP. And that corresponds to a volume I went with about 22 milliliters. And then with that in mind, my half neutralization would be half of 22 or 11 milliliters. And actually, B and C are the same answer. Where does the, is the pH equal to pKa? That's at the half equivalence point. So that's also 11 milliliters. Um, where would the pH pr principally depend upon the excess uh, base added? And that would be after the equivalence point. So I put greater than 22 milliliters. Um, where would the molar concentration of that weak acid you're titrating be greater than its conjugate base? And that would be before the half neutralization point. And then F, this is a tricky one. Where are you most likely to get a buffer solution? Remember. Buffers work best if the molar concentration of your base and your acid are kind of ballpark similar. So at the uh, half equivalence point is the best. And so I kind of put um, on either side of that half neutralization point. Uh, oh, 
this part isn't right. It's most likely a buffered solution near the equivalence point. That's not true, but this is true. So you can see what I did is I took the half neutralization point, about 11, and I added and subtracted five points. If you get too close to the equivalence point, it's not good because you don't have much of that weak acid left. Okay. So, all right, snooze. I thought I restarted. Maybe I didn't. Okay. Uh, given 0.15 molar concentration of this weak acid, what is its pH? And so you're always going to start out with writing the equilibria, that thing splitting apart. Uh, with uh, equilibria, we can write an equilibrium constant expression, like the urine in unit 3. And you can kind of see what it's a Ka expression, really. Um, and then from that, we could, or the next step would be to create, I did, uh, an ice table. Uh, initial molar concentration of the weak acid would be the 0 0.5, 0 0.15 molar. Nothing of the other, the H plus and its conjugate base. The change is minus x plus x plus x, and you kind of see how this works. Apply a simplifying assumption. If x is pretty darn small compared to the 0.15, then 0.15 minus x is, essentially becomes 0.15. And then life becomes easier when we would substitute back into our Ka expression. So the molar concentration then, or x equal to 0 0.0014, which is also the molar concentration of the hydrogen ion, then to get pH, you have to take negative log of that. Uh, the next one. So in this case, you can see the two things that I, uh, looks like I had a certain volume and molarity of NaOCl. Now, OCl is, is what's of interest here. That's actually the conjugate base of HOCl, OCl minus. So you can see that we're creating a buffered solution here. Um, so I'm going to use the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. Uh, so basically, no pun intended, what I do here on the next things, two things, is to come up with the moles of base which is your OCl minus and moles of acid, which is your HOCl. And then plug them into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. The next one, a uh, couple titration problems. Um, notice, yeah, I, re I really like writing underneath the species what, what we've got going on. So it looks like the analyte is that CH3COOH, got a 25 mil alpha plot with no polarity. Notice it tells us that this is actually at the equivalence point. At the equivalence point, it has the volume and molarity of our NaOH. And I kind of went out this year when I did this problem in my answer key. I said if you're at the equivalence point and it's a, um, it's a monoprotic, uh, if it reacts in a one-to-one -one relationship, then actually you're, you have the same moles of, uh, well, you have the same moles of acid, okay? Um, no, 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 darn it. Okay, start all over again. <laughs> it, told, it tells us that when we titrated it to, to the equivalence point to 20.4 milliliters, this uh, volume of interest is 10.2. And 10.2 is half of 20.4. So then at the equivalence, at half the equivalence point, then basically what I have made is I've taken um, all, I've taken half of my CH3COOH and converted to CH3COO minus. So I have, uh, uh, and also we know that at half the equivalence point, the pH is equal to pKa. That was my point. And then to kind of follow up, I think following up, same molarity and such, yep. Okay, so in this one though, um, switching it up, we wanna know what is the pH at the equivalence point. And at the equivalence point then, that means all of those two things are gone. My C3COOH and my NaOH, all gone. So the thing that's driving the pH at this point then actually is the presence of the C3COO minus. And that, actually, you can see it down here. That is going to accept a proton. It's going to make your solution basic, like I show right here. So what I need to do is come up with what is the molarity of that conjugate base, that acetate ion that was formed. 
And so to do that, you can kind of see what I did up above. I got the millimoles that was formed divided by the total volume, which was 25 plus 20.4. So 0 0.121 molar was the molar concentration of the acetate ion. Then I have to kind of do it like I did the first problem, or uh, yeah, one of the first problems we did earlier in the test. So one of the catches is I'm not given KB of acetate, but I'm given KA of acetic acid. So right here is where I knock out what is the KB of uh, CH3CO minus by taking KW divided by KA. So I'll need to know that for uh, once I do my ice table, put the initial molar concentration of the acetate ion. Uh, so apply the simplifying assumption. Yep. Now there's not really a catch, but remember then what X is equal to the molar concentration of hydroxide ion. So you can kind of see in the right there in that box, you have to do a little finagling to get to pH. But that's it. Okay, so again, this will all be posted. And I did record that, which I don't always. So let's pick up where we left off. And the theme of, uh, you know, I'm going to say my homework's not done. I don't have any unit five homework done. It's kind of a long story, but this semester has been kind of busy for me. Academically speaking, aside from other fun things that happen in, in my life. So, but I'll get it done by Sunday. Uh, so laws of thermodynamics, zero flaw. And this one, um, I know I, I shouldn't take time, but this one's just, uh, it's like the duh law, I think, because it's like if A is equal to C, okay, and B is equal to C, that's what it's saying, then guess what? A is equal to B. So it says if something's in thermodynamic equilibrium with the third thing, that would be C, and the second thing is also in thermodynamic with the third thing, C, then A is equal to B. Yeah, right. They come up with these laws, and I'm like, okay. Um, first law, and in order for this to make sense, or for other things to make sense, I'm going to go ahead and draw, um, let's see, what is that? I know the two things together is the universe, and they're not always round, okay, but this whole thing is the universe. Oh yeah, we have two S's. We have the system, and we have the surroundings. Okay. It says the internal energy of the system increases. Here's my system. It's the internal energy is going to increase. Guess what? And this is kind of a dull one too. Um, if energy is transferred in from the surroundings. Makes sense to me. It also says, and we'll kind of talk about an energy in and a work done term. If we do work is done on the system by the surroundings, I'll put big W for work in. And in both of those scenarios, the energy of the system is going to increase. Like that. Yeah. So anyway. Second law. Uh, and you know, it's chaos. It really is. We talked about what entropy is. Entropy is disorder. And we said that um, disorder is actually favored with regard to being spontaneous. And so the, the entropy of the universe, to make sure I've got terms in it, is always increasing for spontaneously occurring processes. The third law, and again, I hate to like pick on anybody, and there's more depth to this, I know, but think of what we're talking about here. We're taking um, a substance to absolute zero. How much motion do we have at absolute zero? Zero. So it's a very, very cold, like, you can't even be at absolute zero because by definition, all that has motion. You don't have motion at absolute zero. So good luck getting there, right? So um, uh, if something is at that temperature, absolute zero, and in its crystalline form, then it has no entropy. So like if you could, if you could like freeze a person down to absolute <laughs> zero, technically the entropy would stop, right? right? So everything would just be. Yes. And then if they thought out and talk about like, cryogenics. Yes. Yeah, that'd be like, that's legit. Yes. And but you can't pull anything to absolute zero. <laughs> right? No. No, there were some um I might have said this in Chem One, but like a few years ago there's like 
Yeah, they got to like negative Kelvin temperatures, like really. And it was like a statistics thing. It was kind of like a bell curve, like, yeah, part of this is over in the negative K. Like, no. Mm -hmm. There's no negatives in Kelvin, right? That's just impossible. Right. You can't stop stuff that's already stopped, right? Right. Like, yeah, you technically you can't even stop it. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. That's great. <laughs> So this would be to summarize that second law that the entropy of the universe is always increasing for funking processes. Now, we're going to introduce another factor. It's not just um, entropy that drives spontaneity. The other one, actually we talked about it on Wednesday. The other one is um, dispersion of energy. So this would be dispersion of matter. You have a lot of energy, excuse me, entropy. If you have a lot of entropy, you have dispersion of matter. So, I mean, this makes sense according to kind of the picture of things. The change in entropy of the universe will be equal to the change in entropy felt or exhibited by your system plus the change in entropy exhibited by your surroundings. Makes sense. Okay. Now, this is focusing back on our system. So, we're getting away from the universe, focusing on our system. Now we did these, uh, we did the final minus initial before, I think it was with enthalpy, like the H's, the delta H's, enthalpy, and it's always final minus initial. Um, so it's always final minus initial, and we can do this. In fact, what we're going to do is a very similar process to what we did with enthalpy. I know it's all weird, enthalpy, entropy, the two different things. Oh. But basically, we're going to focus on the product side. We're going to, the, 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 the capital E thing is actually the summation. So we're going to focus on the product side. We're going to add them all up. And then we're going to focus on the reactant side. We're going to add them all up. And then we're going to do one last subtraction. So if you remember that sort of problem, that's what we're going to do. That knots I talked about before, and we had this when we talked about um, thermodynamics and enthalpy too. OK, the little circle means knot, or I call it knot. So delta S naught or delta anything naught, the naught means standard conditions with regard to temperature and pressure. Another one of my pet peeves, and I don't know where it comes from, because frankly I don't care, but the standard conditions for um, working gas problems are different than the standard conditions for working thermodynamic problems. For gas problems, are I thinking about this right, it's zero Kelvin. No, oh, there, it should be. Uh, zero Celsius. Thank you. Zero Celsius. <laughs> For thermodynamics uh, problems, it's 25 Celsius. Two times eight. Okay. Notice, and we'll be talking more about this uh, probably next Friday. The other thing about standard conditions is it adds a con concentration for aqueous solutions. One mole. So that's new. All right. I got some tables. Okay, so now here, finally, we see some entropy values at standard temperature and pressure. You notice they've got 298 Kelvin, which is 25 Celsius. Okay, and you don't see any zero entropies here, and you don't see any negative entropies here. Okay, makes sense. But you see some, some kind of low numbers. Check this out. I never thought about like this, but if you grab your, um, if you grab your lead pencils, I don't know what it could call lead. I guess it used to be lead, but now it's actually just carbon, sheets of carbon, graphite. Okay? Those cute le that cute little material at 25 degrees Celsius is at a very low entropy. That's kind of funny. Um, cool. Now these are standard molar enthalpies, so energy per Kelvin per mole. Can I ask you a quick question? Uh -huh. for the, heck of it? the graphite is the same material as the diamond and as the gas vapor of carbon, but there's a huge difference in the energy mm -hmm. depending on, I mean... Well, the form. If those, those are like called Chris, allotropes. Those are called oh. allotropic forms. Okay, I was wondering if it had to do with the molecular structure. It, it does have to do with molecular structure okay. because we said the, the more complicated it is, the higher the entropy, the more extravagant it is. Oh, and okay. the more basic it is, the lower the entropy. Okay. So yeah, those are, and it's how the carbon atoms are arranged. Yeah, those are called allotropes. 
Sometimes you really aren't anybody that super special. I mean, right? Well, that's true. They, the way they are arranged, yeah, are not as complicated. Yeah, I like, yeah, the diet's even better. <laughs> hmm. Okay, so here are some, these should be in your open sex books. Now, I wanted to mention, though, and so I will, these are what we call thermodynamic properties. Okay, so these are your enthalpies. Enthalpy, enthalpy. This is our entropy, entropy. Do you see what I'm saying? They're like, <laughs> with the same word. Oh my gosh. And the G is something we're going to talk about soon, and actually that's Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy. Finally, something that doesn't sound like everything else. Gives free energy. So those are all in one shot. And yeah, again, we see that carbon um, as a solid in its two uh, allotropic forms. And actually, it's got a third one. It's not even a fourth one. I think it's what the fourth one is. The third one is buckyball. Remember we talked about that? It was first found on meteorites. Okay. More tables, and it looks like it's broken up by element. <laughs> so let's work a problem like I was telling you before. We're going to use that the, the cha change in the delta S is equal to the summation of the products minus the summation of the reactants, the summation of the final minus the summation of the initial. So it's going to feel like an enthalpy problem, like I think we've done before. So we're going to knock out the change in entropy for this reaction. And then based upon that, we're going to say, is it becoming more ordered? Is the entropy decreasing? Is it becoming more ordered? Or is it becoming more disordered? Is the entropy getting larger and increasing? There we go. So these uh, four values should be on one of those tables, if not a couple of those tables that we looked at just a little bit ago. Okay. And these are the values that we're going to use. In working a problem like this, and you might find a problem like this on your final exam. So remember on your final exam, you're going to have stuff over the four units, and then also stuff over this 50 unit material. Oh, plus you probably have homework to do this. I'll have homework to do this weekend. So it's always final minus initial. So can you see where the final are the products and initial the reactants? The little a and b are the stoichiometric coefficients. Okay, so here we go. On the product side, the coefficient in front of the CO2 is 1. So we have 1 mole of CO2. And then from the table, that's 213.7 joules per mole Kelvin. Just a little bit. Then also on the product side, with a coefficient of 2, I thought it sounded like an announcer, like a wrestling announcer. We have 2 moles of water. Sorry, 2 moles of H2O. And it's, um, it's more... Entropy is 69.9 joules per mole Kelvin. So one of the things about getting this sort of problem right is to just be careful. I would go ahead and knock that out. If you go ahead and do that math, you're going to get 353.5. And notice the units of moles have canceled, and now we have units of joules per Kelvin. And then we turn our attention to the reactant side. On the reactant side, we have one mole of CH4, and its uh, molar entropy uh, is 186.3 joules per mole Kelvin. And then also on the reactant side, we had two moles of O2, and its um, entropy, molar entropy, is 205.1 joules per mole Kelvin. Go ahead and knock that out and you come up with 5.96.5 and then units also then would be joules per Kelvin. 
So can you see on the product side, we have less entropy. Does that seem right? And on the reactive side, we have more entropy. So you think entropy is increasing or decreasing? It is decreasing. When we do our subtraction up here, are we going to get a negative or a positive number? We're going to get a negative number. Yep. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. When I started this just before, you know, I just started the play. Um, remember how we used to break down like a thing by its molecular weight and go underneath, okay, two of that, one of that, and you make a little table underneath the elements? Because that's what I did with the reactant side. And that's okay. how I came up with the total. Would you accept that? Yeah. Instead of oh, yeah. Out? Definitely. Yeah. Because okay. you're showing your work and you're keeping organized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So then to very good. so to get the final answer then, um, our delta S, our change in entropy, the knot means the standard conditions, will be our 353.5 minus 596.5. And sometimes I'll put, you see, you put those in parentheses and then outside put joules per Kelvin that would be fine. So you're right, we get a negative 243.0 joules per couple. And we're going to hit this in part two, but one of the things that we just did is you guys told me that it's, uh, let's see, it's going from, you said it's becoming more ordered? Goodness. Right? If something's becoming more ordered, it actually is going to have a negative delta S. I just went. Okay. Yep, so our negative delta S. Now, we did this with our delta H's. Don't let the... I usually say negative, but another way to say negative is less than zero. So if delta S is negative, or delta S is less than zero, then it's creating order. And I'm going to add something to that, because again, I'm thinking ahead to part two. Um, I'm going to say that this disfavors spontaneity. I just like the word spontaneity. Spontaneity. I might not even be spelling it right. That disfavors spontaneity. Doesn't mean it won't be spontaneous because there's this is one of two elements that tell us what it's going to be spontaneous. Cool. So the change in entropy of the surroundings. Now get your bearings, there's too many S's here. Okay, the change in entropy of the surroundings, and I think we had this maybe before. Q is that Q is equal to MC sub P delta T, and actually later on we said Q, um, if it's constant pressure, is equal to delta H too. Is equal to negative delta H of the system. So kind of whatever change you have here in the surroundings is negative whatever change you're going to have here in the system. I think that makes sense. Okay, so these will be due, so we'll all be doing this this weekend, and I'll post them by Sunday night, midnight. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at part two, see how far we get. If you're a slide counter, there are 49 slides in part two. <laughs> odds of getting through part two are about the odds of having a negative Kelvin temperature. I don't know because some of the stuff we've already kind of been talking about. So I'm so excited. I ordered through Amazon like a conditioner for these are these whiteboards are Quartet brand. And I'm gonna see if I can get something so this thing does not work like a it's not a whiteboard. Okay, because I want to draw something else like it. So spontaneous reaction. Um, let's go ahead and do A plus B. I also ordered new ones. They like have little plungers in them and 
you know, to be a teacher, you gotta kind of enjoy these things. Um, in equilibrium with C and D, okay? So if a reaction proceeds from left to right, that's all we're saying. It's kind of what we've been talking about. If it goes from left to right as written, we call it spontaneous. Goodness gracious. You know what my next slide is? If it goes from right back to left again by itself, we call it non-spontaneous. Okay. You got it. <laughs> Good. So that's really like an equation in equilibrium that is a non-spontaneous equation. No. If something's in equilibrium, it's neither spontaneous or non-spontaneous. If it's out of equilibrium and it's going from right back to left so. again, then it's not spontaneous. Yep. And if it's out of equilibrium and it's going from left to right, it's spontaneous. Yep. But here's the funny part. The thing about the equilibrium arrows is you can, they're, they're like a, they, you can switch them around. So that's the other thing I think is so funny. Okay, so if it's non-spontaneous and it bugs you, then just switch reactants and products or swing the whole thing around and nobody bugs you. And then it's spontaneous. It almost sounds like it's getting like like physics theoretical that it's being <laughs> forced this way and then it's pulled that way naturally uh -huh. into something. Yeah, it's like you can do this. Okay, and this is a deja vu slide. If I knew how to spell deja vu, I would, but I don't. Um, so we said actually in part one that uh, what the universe wants to do is get rid of its energy and get rid of its matter. Okay, it just wants to do that. Okay, and I guess I could draw a system. You can still see my system is here. Okay, what it wants to do is get rid of its matter. We call that the dispersion of matter. And it also wants to get rid of its energy. It just does. And if it does that, then it's happy. Of course, the dispersion of matter would be an increase, INC, in uh, S, which is entropy. And a little bit ago, we decided uh, that would mean as far as the change in entropy, delta S, that's positive, right? Because the negative one is decreasing entropy, the positive one is increasing entropy. Well, actually, you can see a slide coming up. Help me out. What is it when a system... Um, releases energy into its surroundings. Starts letter E. They both start letter E. I'm sorry, what was that again? When a system releases energy, thermal energy, into its surroundings. Ex exothermic, exactly. You guys got it. Very good. So this would be exothermic for happy. Now, is that, um, we, we talk in terms of thermal energy, or energy, both actually, as delta H is exothermic. Is delta H positive or negative? Negative, yep. So I'm going to put delta H less than zero. That makes the system happy. It's like falling on that. It cannot help but be spontaneous if it's doing one of those things. And then I'm going to kind of talk you through some possibilities. Well, what if it's doing one of those things but not the other thing? Well, then it depends on how big a factor the one is from the other. Okay. So physical or chemical changes that occur spontaneously, or happy, must be accompanied by perhaps both of those shifts or at least one of those shifts. Check this out since I'm on a... So if this is my system, 
what if I am adding energy in, what would we call that? Endothermic? That's the opposite of the dispersion of energy. That's the concentration of energy. And what if I am doing the opposite of the dispersion of matter? Um, so matter, I'll say, coming together, and that would be decreasing um, S. So endothermic, you would tell me my delta H is positive. And here, what's my delta S? It's negative. This is never spontaneous. This is what? Never spontaneous. Well, I have a slide to say as much, but I thought I'd put it right there. Okay, so here we go. And your homework's going to go probably something like this. Uh, this is dry ice. Dry ice. Um, if there's, no, no wa there's no water here. This is just air. So dry ice is solid CO2. So I'll put CO2S here. CO2 solid. And then um, you might think that that's carbon dioxide gas, but actually that's, that's uh, water that is um, condensing. But anyway... The point is that outside here, we have CO2 gas. So solid is going to form a gas. What do you think? Do you think that that is, um, how many people think that that is increasing entropy? I do too, increasing entropy, yep. So this would be a case where your dispersion of matter increasing entropy is like this. Now, one of the things that we know about phase changes, it seems like we've been so long, but actually, how many people think this is an endothermic phase change? It takes energy to break those bonds. It's endothermic. Oh, wow. So here we have an endothermic this, and here we have an increasing so that's an example if you have the two things working against each other. So this would be E for energy in endothermic. So it's possible. That's a good example. So it's endothermic and it creates more disorder. Let's look at this. So um, here actually uh, anytime your uh, mug frosts over like that, basically um, H2O gas in the room has liquefied or condensed H2O liquid. So, all right, how many people think that this is creating more disorder? I don't think it's creating order. Me too. It's becoming more ordered. So it's becoming more ordered. All right. So that disfavors spontaneity. What about, is this endo or exo? <laughs> you know how I think of it? I think of it as the opposite of this. You guys probably would tell me that that's endo, right? Just like you told me about the ice going to form a gas. So liquid going to form a gas is endo. So I'm here to tell you that that actually is exothermic. And yes, this vapor the gas is, is cold and actually it's providing a place to remove the energy and allow that to happen. So, of the two things we have going on here, again, they're fighting each other. Um, it's becoming more ordered, okay, but it's exothermic. So, what happens? So, this all goes to say that you have to look at both. You have to look at the energy change and dispersing energy, then you got that going for you. And you also have to look at the entropy change. So if it's dispersing matter, you have that going for you. But it's possible that you have one thing going for you, one thing not. Or both things not. Okay. So one of the things, remember back in Chem 1, and, and I think you guys are doing pretty good with this, you guys told me a delta, you, so, you said it's exothermic, your delta H's are negative. If it's endothermic, yeah, your delta H's are positive. 
So also you need to remember the convention for your delta S's. And then one more thing is going to be delta G's here. So your delta S is your change in entropy. If they're positive, um, that means we said that it is um, becoming more disordered than normal. Entropy of the system is increasing. Okay. And it's I'm going to go ahead and add something up here. I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and say favors. You know my favorite word, spontaneity. I'll probably spell that different every time I spell it. Favor spontaneity. So negative entropy changes. Then the entropy is decreasing instead of dispersing matter. Matter's coming together, and this disfavors spontaneity. Not to say it won't happen. Something like that. Okay, delta H is positive. That's what exothermy. Oh, darn. I knew that. <laughs> delta H is positive. That's endothermy. And endothermy, does it favor or disfavor spontaneity? Disfavor spontaneity. Yep. I'll just put disfavors S. And then delta H is negative. Now that's your exothermic. And that favors spontaneity. It's for spunky spontaneity. Okay, so that's where we'll pick up. We built ourselves up to the G's. So we have H's, S's, and we're going to have G's on Monday. Okay?